My name is Neil Vandery. It's my pleasure to be your officiator tonight. As people come up the stairs and start to enter into the sanctuary, I'd like to let you know a little bit about our church, what we do, and how we do it. Also, want to welcome everyone who's coming in, to, in there to us to, uh, through the live stream. We sometimes have up to 60 people following the live stream. I don't know how many people are going to be there tonight, but I welcome all of those folks as well. Also, I have a few people here for, who are from far, far away. I don't see them right now, but here's Beth and Richard. They do a three-hour round trip from Naples. Steve, are you here? He's coming up now, I'm sure, up the stairs. Steve does a six- or seven-hour round trip to come here from Bradenton, Tampa area. And we also have from the Melbourne area, John and Diane. So welcome everyone who's come from near and far. I want to also wish you all a Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah, which has just passed. And I hope that you're enjoying this season. Here at uh, Perpetual Life, it's our mission to bring together people who are seeking unlimited lifespans. We are brought here despite the fact that we may be Christian or Jewish, uh, atheist or Hindu, whatever your, your belief system may be, all of those are, are fine, but what brings us together and what keeps us together here is our quest for an unlimited lifespan. We're going to be hearing some things tonight about reversing aging. We're going to have a presentation on cryonics tonight, both things that are well in order here, and I'm so glad to have the presentations that we have coming up. We follow the prophets Arthur C. Clarke, who has written so much about things that are going to occur in the future. We also follow Nikolai Fedorov's philosophy of the common task for humanity. We're a science-based, transhumanist church, and our faith is in humanity to find a way toward unlimited lifespans and reverse the aging process. After our presentation tonight, we will be holding the ceremony of the remembrance of the resurrectables. It's your, you're welcome to stay in the sanctuary if you'd like to experience some of that. It's where we will put a short biographical part on the screen about people who are currently in cryonic stasis. So this is our ceremony for the remembrance of the resurrectables. In January, next month, we will have two events here. We're going to be celebrating Bedford Day on January 10th, Thursday evening, with a presentation and a potluck social. And on January 24th, we'll be here with Steve Perry, who's giving a presentation on GDF 11. Who's heard of GDF 11? Okay, so Steve Perry is going to be here. He's going to give you a great presentation on that. And in both cases, our events will, our doors will open at six o'clock and the event will start at seven o'clock. Want to call to your attention that we do have a lending library in the back outer sanctuary and you're welcome to rent, uh, check out a book, borrow a book, check it out and bring it back next month after you've read it and enjoyed it. And uh, we're also looking for donations for the bookstore. All right. All right. Now we're going to be having two sets of people filming here tonight. Richard, glad to have you here. And uh, just so that you know, we, we are filming live streaming as well as uh, a, a, a little bit of filming that Richard's doing tonight. I'm going to get right into our presentation because we've got two speakers tonight and I want to get things started. So let me give you an introduction to our first speaker tonight. His name is Dennis Kowalski, and he's a firefighter and nationally registered EMT paramedic in Milwaukee. He's certified in advanced cardiac life support and advanced pediatric life support, and is a CPR instructor for the American Heart Association. As a firefighter and a paramedic, Dennis has had lots of experience dealing with life and death. His training and skills have given him numerous opportunities to be part of saving lives while helping others that are in great distress. In addition to his day job, he also teaches emergency medicine at Milwaukee Fire Academy and the Milwaukee County Emergency Medical Center. He's been a national registry examiner at the local technical college where he helped to certify many new emergency medical technicians and paramedics. As for problem solving under pressure, he's managed to set up emergency triage at mass casualty incidents incidents around. Dennis has served in the U.S. Marine Corps and went to the University of Wish Waukesha, Waukesha <laughs> to study philosophy and astronomy. He's always been, a, he's always been and continues to be a, a great love of his, and Dennis has volunteered in many charitable causes, including you, the United States Marine Corps, Toys for Tots, Disabled American Veterans, and currently Project Staying Alive, 
which is an urban initiative to teach children the alternatives to violent, violence. He also works with the Focus and Survive programs designed to educate the community about fire safety and prevention. He's a member of the Cato Institute, a public policy research organization dedicated to the principles of individual liberty. He's happily married to Maria with three young boys. On top of all this, Dennis has served as Cryonics Institute president for the last seven years. The Cryonics Institute is one of the world's leading cryonics organizations. So help me, ladies and gentlemen in Hollywood, to welcome our first speaker this evening, Mr. Dennis Kowalski, president of CI Cryonics Institute. Come on up, Dennis. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Bill, for having me here at the Church of Perpetual Life. Um, so, who am I? He, he gave a really good introduction of what I do in my day job. I drive an ambulance. I take people to the hospital when they're in need. That's my day job. And in my night job, I take people to a hospital in the future should that hospital exist. So the two things that I do kind of match up very well. But uh, why am I here and why are we talking about cryonics? I have a little video I put together on our website and I'm gonna ask them to queue up that video so that we can take a look at, in, in a nutshell of what the cryonics pro process consists of and then we'll talk about it in some greater depth. The fascinating science of cryonics could give people a second chance at life. The whole idea of cryonics started with physics professor Robert Edinger. He pioneered the movement with his seminal book the prospect for immortality. He then went on to launch the Cryonics Institute. But just what is cryonics, and what does the Cryonics Institute do? Cryonics is a procedure that preserves the human body at low temperatures after death, in the hope it can be revived in the future. The process should begin immediately after a person is declared legally dead. Even though the heart has stopped beating, there's still brain function during this period so a heart-lung resuscitator is used to stabilize the body and keep the brain supplied with blood and oxygen. The body is cooled in an ice bath to slow down metabolic demand and to protect both DNA and organ structure. Then anticoagulants and protective medications are injected into the body to stop the blood clotting during transit. The body is then packed in ice and transported to a cryonics facility. Once there, a process called vitrification begins, where the blood is replaced with a cryoprotectant antifreeze solution. This is done to prevent the cells from freezing and to stop ice crystals from forming around organs at extremely low temperatures. The body is then placed in a computerized vapor cooling chamber and cooled to negative 196 degrees Celsius. Once the body is properly cooled, the patient is transferred to a long-term cryostat storage container. Thousands of people are signed up for cryonics throughout the world, and the numbers are steadily growing. The Cryonics Institute is the world's largest provider of whole-body cryonics. They have performed more whole-body human and pet cryosuspensions than any other organization. The Cryonics Institute is also the most affordable cryonics company, with a whole-body suspension fee of only $28,000. Most people could afford this cost with simple life insurance. Our organization is a member-owned nonprofit with open financial records. Suspension money collected is carefully invested in secure endowment-like securities. The investment dividends earned from these investments fund perpetual storage and cryonics upkeep. This is how CI has operated since 1976. Some people prematurely dismiss cryonics because the technology to revive someone who has been cryogenically frozen does not exist yet. But they miss the point. Cryonics is really an ambulance ride now to a future hospital where that technology may someday exist. What does science say? There are now peer-reviewed scientific papers supporting cryonics, as well as many PhDs who have gone on record to support cryonics. Recent advances in stem cells, nanotechnology, and genetic engineering are proving that what was once considered impossible is becoming routine. 
Some have suggested that someday even aging itself may be halted or reversed. People once considered dead only 50 years ago, today are revived with CPR and cardiac defibrillation. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation and organ transplant technology were once shunned by primitive thinkers, but today they are hailed as life-saving advances. If history has taught us anything, no one knows the future, and it is foolish to say what future technology will be impossible. Considering the alternative, which is certain death, Cryonics is a rational scientific wager with little to lose and virtually everything to gain. Check out cryonics.org to learn more. Okay, so in a nutshell, that's cryonics. Um, how did I get involved with cryonics? I'm often asked that by uh, interviewers, and I've had many interviews, social blogs, uh, television stations, radio shows, you name it. And they asked me some of these questions and I thought, well, what better way to present the information to you guys than to write down some of these questions and the answers that are most often given under their circumstances. So, how did I get involved? When I was a young lad, maybe 14, 15 years of age, I remember watching the Phil Donahue show. I don't know if you guys remember that. And uh, in search of with Leonard Nimoy, he had an episode on cryonics. And I thought to myself, boy, that's really interesting. That's really fascinating. Instead of getting buried or cremated, they're going to take and save these bodies and maybe someday bring them back, maybe some future technology. And, you know, I, I was starting to see, even in my young age, things that were once impossible just a few years ago, suddenly they're possible. And, and we're starting to see that even at a faster rate now. How many people have uh, cell phones, right? Think of what a cell phone would be considered maybe 30 years ago. It's like a crystal ball. You can access all the knowledge of mankind. You can access any person on the face of the earth. But we, we almost take it for granted. It's just a Google smartphone in our pocket. But it was impossible at one point. It was magic at that point. Today, it's just everyday science. So don't, don't be so quick to judge on what is or is not possible. I think the slide that was up here before the picture of Robert Edinger had uh, Arthur C. Clarke, who said that in his famous three laws, I think it was law number one, any scientist who says that something is impossible is almost always eventually proven wrong. And any scientist who says something is possible eventually is proven right. So that's kind of the whole attitude towards longevity, life extension, and cryonics. And I'll tell you how that fits in and fits all together. But anyways, as a young kid, I thought, that's really fascinating. But how, just how, are they going to be able to actually bring people back? You know, it's all good and well to say the future's going to do it. I needed just a little bit more than that. So then some time went on, and I remember reading a book by Eric Drexler called The Engines of Creation. And that book was about molecular nanotechnology. It's just another fancy word for saying the reverse engineering of life at the micro, micro levels. If we could see, if we could get inside the molecules and atoms and see how the parts and components work, we could actually understand the mystery of life. It's not a mystery then, it's just a matter of a blueprint, following the blueprint and seeing how nature does this and how nature does that. So he had a chapter in chapter nine on chronics saying, boy, th these people are right. There is processes in nature where you can actually reverse engineer the death process. I mean, anyone who has ever had a child, you've, you're taking older adult cells, male and female cells, and you're converting them back into baby cells. So there is a mechanism. We just don't know exactly how it works. But it's not like we're trying to come up with something new anti-gravity, time travel, this is something that already exists in nature. It's just as if G Da Vinci said, I see this bird flying overhead. I know that eventually we'll be able to figure out how to fly. I mean, he was years ahead of his time. We didn't have uh, combustion engines and we didn't have bicycles, uh, the, the machinery that the Wright brothers had to put together the first plane, but he had the proof and principle in nature flying right over his head. We have those things with cryonics. We don't have the finished technology yet, 
but we do can we do we can see where this is leading so that's what really got me involved being a procrastinator I still took many years before I signed up in chronics I think I that was in my 20s I didn't sign up until I was like 35 um, 36 years old and then I once I became a member of the chronics Institute I said I want to do more I want to make this a better place because if this life raft is going to work it's going to require all of us to pull together to dedicate our time and our money and volunteer to make the life raft work so I then I from there I uh, was democratically elected by the other members to get on the board of directors so that's important we're a democratically run organization the members run the organization and then after I was on the board of directors they voted me in as an officer so we all have a vested interest in Kranix it's not like some outside entity is just collecting the money and we'll see you later Jack in this case we are all in this together in Kranix so that's why I got involved so I'm often asked how do we know this will work how do we know you know um, the honest answer is we don't you know how do we know anything will work when you get in my if, if there if the if the roof of this building collapsed and and uh, you guys were horribly injured and a bunch of ambulances came how do you know for sure you're gonna make it at the hospital you don't but you do know that if you don't get an ambulance you won't find out if you get in the ambulance you might have a chance that's life life is not full of guarantees but doing nothing ensures that you won't have a chance that's another reason I got involved so some people say uh, aren't we just afraid of dying I'm gonna ask you a question how many people here are afraid of dying okay maybe a better way of asking that is I was in the Marines I fought as a firefighter I'm not afraid to get into dangerous situations on the other hand I look both ways when I cross the street if someone passed a gun around here and said let's play Russian roulette how many of you would do that we all have a pragmatic fear of death we all pragmatically don't want to die okay how many people exercise eat well go to the doctor take your medications right so you do care about life you're only fooling yourself if you say most people are really saying I don't want to look like a coward and say that I'm afraid to die and I'm stoic and when it's my time it's my time you know you'll ask a lot of people who are 20 years old you'll say when you're 90 or you know how old do you want to live well till I'm 90 well, ask that same person when they're 89 and healthy so you mean tomorrow you ready to go here's the gun you know <laughs> so so obviously most people are just fooling themselves and they're just kind of lying to themselves on that one so uh, what will revival look like I don't know I don't know the future but I do know where we're heading with stem cell technologies I do know that we've figured out in a strange way that we can take older cells that are in our your arm for instance and we can trick those cells into becoming embryonic stem cells all over again this has been done a couple years ago there was a, a baby that was born with a male formed trachea okay so they took some of that baby's skin cells from its arm they were older they were already differentiated into skin cells they tricked them into becoming embryonic stem cells put them in a petri dish with some trachea cells grew them into a petri dish of of these trachea cells and they put them through a 3d biological printer just like your pr a regular printer and printed up a trachea it was sewed into that baby the child has a new trachea it's his own trachea there's no tissue rejection there's no drugs and medications anymore I mean it was a miracle through science so that was impossible just a couple decades ago because we didn't have 3d printers we didn't have stem cells what's next when will we eventually be able to print hearts and livers or whole bodies so you know it, it's it's just a matter of time so uh, other questions I've been asked um, ever uh, have we ever woken up a mouse or an animal 
know, they say, fine, if you could do that, if you could, you know, bring back a lab mouse, then I'm with you, right? If you could bring back an animal. I'd argue that what we're doing, what we're proposing to do is very hard. We're not there yet. If we were able to bring back mammals, young, healthy, reversed aging, and so forth, it's kind of, um, you wouldn't need chronics to get you there, okay? It's kind of a, a catch-22, a paradox. You're asking for the future without the vehicle to get you there. Chronics isn't the future. It is the vehicle to get you there. So there, if there was the proof of the future, we'd be in the future, and you wouldn't need the vehicle to get you there, if that makes any sense. So it's really the wrong question asking, how come you don't have more concrete evidence? The, the correct answer is, that's what we're doing now. We're gathering the evidence. We're seeking that evidence out. So Chronix is a two-part process. First part, ambulance ride. Second part, future hospital. Future hospital doesn't exist. It's likely to happen based on all the scientific trends we see. But the ambulance ride does exist. You get in the ambulance ride, you have a chance. You don't get in the ambulance ride, you don't have a chance. You're not, you, and if it doesn't work, you are no worse off than anyone who's buried or cremated, minus your $28,000 in life insurance. And we'll talk about why that $28,000 in life insurance is important, because unfortunately, nothing in this world is free, especially advanced science and advanced scientific method. If you get a heart transplant, that's going to cost you close to a million dollars. And that might kill you. Uh, cryonics costs you 28000 It can't make you deader than dead. <laughs> in theory, it could make you alive, okay? So it's really kind of a, a no loss. You're not going to lose the money. Life insurance company will lose the money. Yes, there's some money you have to put in for fees for life insurance. But relatively, we think it's a small amount. We also believe that, well, why do we have to take 28000 at all? Why can't we do it for less? Because there needs to be enough money there so that we don't have to go to your kids and your grandkids and say, hey, we need some more money for liquid nitrogen. We need some more money. We need to take enough money, as we talked about in the film, we need to take $28,000. And most of that money gets put into like an endowment, goes into a stocks and bonds and mutual funds and gains interest, compounds interest over the years. We don't go after the principal. We just use the interest to pay for the perpetual nature of the storage, the utilities, the taxes, the, the salaries of the people that work there. You got to pay for it, so that's why we collect the money. We're a nonprofit, so we're not making money off of this. Not only are we a nonprofit, because you see a lot of bad stuff in the news about nonprofits where the CEO pays themselves, you know, quarter of a million dollars or half a million dollars. We're a nonprofit with open records that are open to the public. You can go on our website. You can see where every dime is spent. All this money is being spent on the life raft. It's your money. It's your organization. It's run by you. That's how, that's how it works. Some people will ask me, um, is there any real science to back it up? Yeah, there's uh, 62 PhDs who've signed a document saying that we'll stake our reputations that this will probably work. Uh, there is scientific peer-reviewed papers that support cryonics. There's not one scientifically reviewed peer-reviewed paper that says it won't work. There's doctors and scientists and people who go on uh, talk shows and sneer at it and kind of roll their eyes and uh, this will never happen, but they've never looked at it seriously. They've never put anything down on paper to try to disprove it. It's just a matter of, yeah, it's kind of weird and out there. There's a lot of things that are weirder and out there. How about if I would have said 50, 60 years ago, uh, I got this great idea of, you know, cutting a heart out of someone, out of a freshly dead corpse and stitching and sewing it into someone else, right? At one time, they'd probably string me up and say, that's Frankenstein, but we call that a heart transplant today, right? How about even the thought of bringing back the dead? Right? A hundred years ago, if your heart stopped, that's it. You'd be dead. But we c commonly pound on people's chests. We do cardiac defibrillation. We bring back the dead. Not all the time, but sometimes. And most people think that's a good thing. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to fight the good fight with chronics. We're trying to extend your life.
So let's see. Um, questions like, uh, isn't it just for the rich? Well, not with life insurance. Okay. Um, if you're young, you can get a policy. If you're older, if you saved your money, your assets, you can deem some of your well, most of it to your family, but some of it to Karanix. Um Some people ask, are we too inexpensive? Why is CI so inexpensive? Uh, other organizations charge, you know, five, six times as much. Well, you know, you could ask the question, well, if five, six times, why not, why not 20 times as much? There's a point of diminishing returns where you start losing life. We want you to be able to afford to do this for yourselves and for your family. And we're not making money. We are a nonprofit. Sure, would more money help? We ask our members to donate more. But we don't want to force you to do more and to put more money in than we have deemed as necessary. So it's just a matter of business models as to how much money is needed. Um, what if I'm too old for life insurance? I talked about that. Uh, isn't dead dead? Well, we talked about CPR. That changed the definition of death. Uh, Chronicists have to be, you have to be legally dead to join up for Chronix. Well, so what does that mean? Does that mean that you're completely dead? What is the point of no return? Well, I'd like to use an analogy. You think of a computer. If you took a computer and you pushed it off the Empire State Building, could you still get the information off the computer? Yeah, probably. You could go into the hard drive and piece it together. If you took the Mona Lisa, if you ran it through a shredder, could you put the pieces together and maybe read the print on a newspaper or took, take a picture of the Mona Lisa? Yeah, it would be kind of broken, but you wouldn't have lost the information that is essential. What we believe is essential is all that tangled nerves and synapses of your brain that makes up your mind, who you are, and your DNA. DNA is pretty hardy. But your mind isn't. So that is the crucial piece that we're trying to save in Karanix. So it's important to try to freeze people as soon as they go into cardiac arrest. It's just like it's important when people go into cardiac arrest that you do what? Call 911, do CPR if you can, because time counts. Time counts in a cardiac arrest. This is no different. This is a cardiac arrest plus ice. This is an extension of traditional emergency medicine where we take over where the other people have given up. Okay. Let's see. Can we guarantee success? Nope. Can't guarantee success when you step in an ambulance. A lot of things could go wrong. Tornado could hit. We could go bankrupt. Just might not work. Again, if you don't try, whether it's cancer research or any kind of medical research, you won't find out. This is the only chance you have. This is it. It's the only physical, scientific chance you have. What about my family and my neighbors? What will they think? They'll think I'm crazy or... or this is actually an argument to bring your family and friends and neighbors along. I have another analogy I like to use. What if you were an airplane? And uh, with your family and friends, and you had this kooky idea about sitting on a wing section that, you know, if the plane crashes, you might make it. And you did. You know, by God's glory, you're the only person who made it. And the rest of the people all died. Tragic, terrible, your family and friends all died. What would you do? Would you commit suicide? Or would you be grateful that you didn't die? Would you pick up the pieces of your life? Would you make new friends and make new family? Would you try to talk your family and friends into cons at least considering Kranix, right? It's not like a religion, like we're trying to pound us down your throat and win people over. It doesn't matter, I mean, to us, other than we don't want to be alone in the future. And when we build a big life raft, the more people we can have in that life raft, the better. It makes the life raft stronger. So, what, is, what does religion say about it? Well, you can get that same heart transplant if you're an atheist, if you're Christian, Muslim, Jewish, or agnostic, if you don't know. Or you might not, based on your religious beliefs, or your political beliefs, or your philosophical beliefs. This is just science. 
Either you believe in science or you don't. Some people would even argue that religion implies you to try to live longer because you've got a lot of work to do. So there's a, there, there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. What about culture shock? People brought in from third world nations with nothing. They tend to thrive here in these industrialized nations because they're not spoiled like the rest of us Americans. They tend to do very well. So basically, I, I don't know. I see this whole thing as logical. It makes sense to me. And I'm going to ask I'm going to ask you guys some questions. Again, who fears death? So the rest of you, you're okay with death. You're ready to die today. If we have someone come out of the back room with a gun, <laughs> who, how about another question? Who loves life? Who loves their family and friends? Who loves life? That's what this is really about, is who loves life. So who wants to be young and healthy? And retain their wisdom. Okay. Who would like to see the future? Who thinks, this is just out of curiosity, we are wealthier as a generation now than we were in the past? I think so, technologically and in a lot of other ways. It's hard sometimes. You look in the news, you see so many tragedies and so many bad things going on. I can remind you, there's some bad things that were going on in the olden days, too. You know, my great-great-grandparents, they didn't have the luxury to sit up here with a microphone and speak to people. They were in the farm fields toiling in the mud just to eat, just to survive. They didn't die of obesity from overweight, heart attacks, and cancers, because they didn't live long enough to get cancer, and they were starving, and that's why they didn't get overweight. They didn't live that long. Uh, brutality? What about World War II and the Nazis? What about the Romans, where spectator sport was tearing people to death? Eh, I think, you know, there's some things in the past, the Middle Ages, some very brutal, brutal existence. I think we're pr probably pretty spoiled when we think we got it bad here. We really have it good. And we're probably, if these trends follow, going to have it a lot better. And those of us in this room who are living in this time, if we ever do get to see the future, are probably going to be amazed at how good they will have it. Maybe those people will be even that much more spoiled. It seems to be a generational thing. So, who thinks this is a good idea? Okay. Who thinks it's a bad idea? Anybody? Huh? Chronics is a bad idea. I don't know. What it, what it, I don't know. You'd have to define it. it's workable well, that that's the yeah well that's the million dollar question you know nobody knows the future we don't know unless we get in the ambulance to see if it's going anywhere or not and it may very well not go anywhere but it's the only ambulance in town so so who, who would consider doing this who is Okay, who is signed up currently with Cranix? Who is not signed up with Cranix? Who would consider doing this? Okay, so we have literature in the back of the room. I have my business card. And you go to the website, and you check it out, and you research. And you don't have to sign up tomorrow. It took me 10 years to sign up. That's, that's how much of a procrastinator I was. Go ahead, do you have a question? I'm expecting the whole physical body, but, okay. His question is, what do we plan on bringing back? The whole body, just the brain? Uh, there's a couple of schools of thought. Some people think that maybe the information will be the only thing that we can bring back, and that information will somehow be uploaded to a, some sort of an Android or a computer system 
or will have like mechanical strength or whatever. Some people think that some sort of a stem cell injection, maybe some kind of a genetically engineered viral, viral repair system, very close to the viral repair systems we have in our body, will repair us from within. We'll look at the DNA and look at, this is what a young person is supposed to look like because the map and the blueprint are in there. But this is what's wrong here, this is what's wrong there, and let's fix it here, let's fix it there. Almost like an infection that makes you sick, but this would be an infection that makes you healthy. And then maybe, not only would it make you healthy and 20 years old with the wisdom of your age, maybe you'll have enhancements too. Maybe they'll charge extra for the enhancements, you know, like x-ray vision or, you know, uh, superhuman Olympic strength or, or so forth. I don't know. The, the truth is nobody knows the future. And this is just an option when you have no other options. So that's some good questions. I, you know, I, I love good questions. Um, go ahead. Okay, so the question is, you sign up, you have a heart attack right now. Can it happen? Well, one good thing is you're in a room with a lot of people who are, are chronicists. So, and some of us are trained medically. So the first thing I would do is run over there, right? And we'd establish CPR. We'd have someone call 911. And we'd do our best to try to save you now. Because the longer you can live and not get in the cryostat, uh, the better your chances will be. Because, you know, new technologies are happening every day. The people frozen in the future might be frozen under better conditions than today. The people frozen today might be frozen under better conditions than the people of the past. It doesn't mean it's a lost cause. It just means that it's less repairs for the future. So that's what we would do. We'd do CPR, try to save you, okay? Now the question would be, did you sign up already? Did you? Okay. So that makes it more difficult. People who haven't signed up, right, we call those postmortems. And we have to contact your family. That takes time. We have to find out if there's financial resources. We have to find out if you really wanted to do this. And, and say you mention it to your wife, but your wife says, nope, absolutely not. It stops there. But if you had put it on paper and signed a legal contract and provided the funding, now we have something to go on and we can battle for you. We can fight for you. So we always say, if you're even remotely thinking about this, you know, do your research, definitely, but don't think too long. You need to sign up, and the younger, the better, because it's, it's cheaper with the life insurance and so forth. Any more questions? Yes. So as we get more people, and as that $28,000, the principal never gets touched, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. We don't care if the stock market goes up or down or up or down like it does like in a seesaw because in the long term, the stock market always goes up. Now, is that possible that the stock market will go down for a long, long, long term? Theoretically possible. We're talking end of, end of civilization type things, you know, asteroids hitting World War III, in which case probably doesn't matter if you're in cryonics anyhow. There's going to be people hiding in caves or, and so forth. But under most normal, feasible um, guesses as to what's going to happen, the stock market will always go up. It'll, go, it'll have terrible corrections, recessions, even depressions. But in the long run, the, the major, you know, 80% of the uh, U.S. economy, uh, world economy, will continue to plug along. And that's what we're investing in. So we can literally hang on forever. No, we don't even need any more customers. I'm going to jump into your Q&A now, Dennis. You've got a lot of people asking you questions, so I'm going to we'll start this. Sure. If you would. Okay. Yes. Oh. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> I really have a two-part question, and that is you haven't mentioned anything about state, federal laws regarding this, and also financial laws. If I, how, how do I... Uh, prepare for the future. If I have investments now, what do I? How do I keep them going while I'm in the deep freeze? 
So I, I have no idea about this. Does your literature have all those details outside there? So, so you don't not only want to live a long time, but you want to take your money with you too. And, and, get, yeah. and, that, and that's good because, you know what, over 40 years, a lot of our members have thought about that. So we, in, we encourage people to set up trusts. And some states and localities have laws against perpetual trusts and some don't. So that's up to you to kind of search out the states that don't and try and find a lawyer that will tailor your trust so that you can keep your money and take some of it with you. We encourage you to leave more to us in a donation because what good is a whole bunch of money that you're never going to see because maybe we could have used it to keep you alive or, or revive you. So we like an idea of, of some money for you, some more money for us, some extra money for funeral directors, air ambulance, maybe a standby team, which we didn't talk about, getting you from point A to point B. With, that is in our literature. Uh, all of that, all, we've talked about all of that. And if you search on our website, it's in resources. And you can ask me and you can email me. I've got my business card out there, and we can talk more about that. Thank Absolutely. And let me just say something to say that within the cry and assist communities, there are people that get together once a year or so to discuss just those things. So uh, once you become signed up for cryonics, then you can meet some people who are looking at doing these things as well. Okay, sure. Before I take another question, I'd just like to go through the slideshow okay. real quick. Sounds good. Uh, this, is Robert this is Robert Edinger. He's the founder of cryonics. He wrote a book, The Prospect of Immortality pretty much launched the whole movement in the 1960s. Yeah, the ideal has been around since forever, you know, with the Egyptians and the pyramids, but he put it to scientific practice. He actually looked at it at, from a physics professor's standpoint. Can this be done? And he put it in the book, and that's what really got everyone's uh, blood boiling and got everyone interested in this. Uh, next slide, real quick. Okay, so... That's our facility in Clinton Township, Michigan. That's where we house our members right now. We've got 270 people, 150 pets, or patients, I should say. That's our uh, business office where we come up with new ideas and brainstorming and have our board of directors meetings, also where people come to uh, grieve um, and uh, about their lost family members. It's not all science, you know, it's, it's about the human touch as well. Uh, that is a quick map of all the people in the world signed up with Cranix Institute. All the green are countries that have people that are signed up. So every continent, except for Antarctica, we even got some people in Africa. Uh, mostly United States, Australia, England, Germany, the English-speaking countries. Uh, that is the facility where we actually would do the cryoprotection uh, washout. The CIVM1 vitrification solutions go in you right there uh, to prepare you to make sure there's not ice damage when you get frozen. Then you go in that cooling box, uh, lowers you down slowly, gradually over a period of several days to a negative uh, 196 Celsius. Very cold. Same temperature that they store embryos and sperm and eggs. That is the final resting place until the future figures things out. And they go into the, those silver uh, lids come off. They're not mechanical. Uh, they're just giant thermos bottles. So when people say, oh, what if someone kicks out the cord, right? Are they going to defrost? They don't understand chronics. Uh We top them off with liquid nitrogen. The insulation is so good, they'd last six months. Six months, uh, but we don't wait that long. We top them off weekly, and we actually measure them every single day. Never had a single problem since 1976. They're the cryostats again. They're actually very tall. All these pictures are on our website, too, in high definition, if you want to download them. That's the cryostats again. Uh, that's kind of what it looks like on the inside, a um, little cutaway to understand how the people are in there. It's actually six people per cryostat because um, they're actually a lot bigger than you think. And they're actually, uh, believe it or not, upside down because your brain is the most important part. So if the liquid nitrogen would evaporate, the last 
thing to go would be your head, the seat of all your intelligence and mind. And uh, that is our website at the bottom for more information. And, uh, and I can still take some more questions if question. you'd like. I think you answered my question. How many people so far? I'll get there in just a second. Okay. Say in the last picture, I, I think answered my question, but you're taking the whole body, not just the part of the body. Yes, the whole body. We don't do neuros at Cranix <laughs> Institute. We don't see a need for that. Uh, for us, the cost savings is marginal. Also, you know, if you look at the Hippocratic Oath, you do no harm. So we don't want to, you know, even if we could grow a new body from the neck stub down, we don't want to take away that part, that scaffolding. We don't know if there's information there. It's best to be conservative and save the body. That's just and, our way and of is looking the, at it. Is there any uh, de deterioration over time? I know the body's frozen, but do you, have you noted any deterioration? At liquid nitrogen temperatures, virtually everything stops. There is some molecular movement, but the equivalence of, of the molecular movement that happens at one second takes about 300,000 years. So if you're a cardiac, you know, they say you have four to five minutes, and then brain death if you go into cardiac arrest if people don't do CPR. That's not entirely true because what if you fall in an icy cold lake? Because we've brought people back a half hour or an hour, right? And they're just fine. They're not brain damaged. Well, what, was, what changed? They had cold ice water around them, and then they got CPR. Well, if you have even colder liquid nitrogen temperatures, virtually everything for all practical purposes stops. So, in, in, in fact, conventional medicine is even wising up, and they're using uh, therapeutic hypothermia. You know, they often will take people, and they're finding, forget all these pharmaceuticals, all these drugs, it's better to cool a patient because we slow down their metabolic need. If they're bleeding out, instead of jamming more blood in their whole blood or more IV solutions and more oxygen, let's just slow down the metabolic need until the surgeons can get in there and patch them up. And even if they patch them up, let's uh, try to knock down the inflammation with the cold. Turns out that cold is actually an incredibly effective piece of medicine. Are you in Arizona too? No, I'm in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That's where I work. Our facility is in Clinton Township, Michigan. Because I remember my, my favorite ball player was in Arizona. I don't know if you're affiliated with, uh, with him. Oh, oh, Ted Williams? Yeah. Yep, yeah, that was uh, a different organization. Good evening. Uh, my question is, um, what has been the progress with animal testing or donor bodies as far as uh, the engineering and biology of some of the latest research showing significant progress in um, reanimating people? No, reanimating, not much. I'm just going to be straight on that. We're not in the future. That's going to take a lot, a lot of, uh, I mean, you're starting to see, it's not going to come up from the chronics industry, okay? We're funded very small. It's going to come from maybe multi, huge multinational billion-dollar companies that are trying to get more chips on a trans or more trans uh, transistors on a chip, they're going to be pushing the limits of nanotechnology, and there's going to be spin-off technology from that. It's going to come from maybe these people who have uh, discovered CRISPR, where they can now genetically engineer maybe some type of a virus that'll help to uh, uh, heal tissues or reverse aging down some other path that I don't even know. The technology that I'm looking at is is more along the lines of what can we do to make the ambulance better. I don't pretend to be the hospital. I know that hospital is just too far in, in advance. But to get, make the hospital better, there's animal studies that maybe we could you know, decrease the solutions this way or we can ramp them up this way or we could change the pressures so that we could get more solution in at a less toxic value. We're, we're doing uh, tests with Professor um, Higgins out at Oregon University trying to make sure that what we're doing on our end gives you a better chance to get to that future hospital. That's a good point. This is plan B. Plan A is Bill's plan, the plan of reversing aging and not having to go through a chronic suspension. But I look at this as life insurance, Dennis. It's our plan B. Safety fall. Here you go. How many people have been frozen already at your organization? At our organization, we have over 170. 
people, over 150 animals, and many tissue samples as well. Animals, pets, cats, dogs, people love their pets. And, you know, now, and, and before they started doing that, now Korea allows you, there's a company out there to clone your pets. So there's some, uh, you know, that's technology that didn't exist before. And who knows what the, the different, uh, maybe in some time in the future, they'll even open that up to human cloning, but, you know, not, not at this point. We're not ready for that. But you made a good point, too, about what life extension. I would, you know, I'm going to stay, I'm going to stand up here and say I would love to be put out of business completely by the life extension people because nobody wants to end up in these cryostats, right? This is the second worst thing that could possibly happen to you. The worst thing being that you're dead and buried or cremated. But if you're dead and you are in a cryostat, you have a chance. And that's all we're doing is providing a chance, a scientific method and a chance where there is no other chance. Well, to that other statement, Bernie, after the event tonight, after both Bill and Dennis speak, we're doing the uh, ceremony tonight where you can see some of the bios and photographs of some people who are in cryostasis tonight. Yes. So um, I have a question. When you go into cryonics, your a death certificate is issued? and then maybe one day you're reanimated in 100 years, 200 years, you're legally dead. You have a death certificate. What, do you, what happens then? You get well, a birth certificate? <laughs> 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 so these are things that the future legal system is going to have to tackle. Uh, one, joke, one joke that my friends gave me in the firehouse was, you know, I, when I retire from the fire department, I get a pension. So in 200 years... What's my pension back pay going to look like? <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're going to say, nope, you were legally dead. Or they're going to say, what, uh, you missed your taxes, and, uh, the, and you're going to have to pay some penalties. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to know is, for the $28,000, that includes my transportation there and everything done? Or ne is that no. So 28000 is like... I hate to use the term cemetery. It's your final interment with until the future can catch up. Um, you always have to go through a funeral director, no matter what, because you're considered legally dead. I don't care how much medical intervention you get. You still have to cross your uh, uh, T's and dot your I's to get a death certificate to cross state lines. You have to use a funeral home. So we like to, instead of seeing them as opposition, that's our friends. That's our network. We can use them. We can get them on board to help out and, you know, maybe administer some heparin or do some CPR and, and maybe move you across the border quicker and pack you in ice. So the, the funeral directors, they're an asset. So, and I'm sorry, what was the rest of the question? So how fast, how fast is fast enough? Uh, we don't know exactly because we don't know how much fidelity is saved in the brain. We don't know how much redundancy is in the brain. So yeah, maybe you lose 20% of your brain, but you're fine because there's redundancy. There's copies of information over and over and over. The brain's pretty plastic, you know, there's plasticity. Uh, even if you lose a part, one part will take over for the other part. But there is a point of diminishing returns where you lose too much and where you've been dead too long. That we call information theoretic death. So that's not like the computer that fell off the Empire State Building. That's the computer that fell in a vat of acid or the body that was buried and eventually decomposes into nothing or cremated so that there is no information left. So information is not really easy to destroy. I mean, think about a newspaper. I can take a newspaper and burn it. And if I don't disturb the ashes, I can actually read the print on a newspaper until I disturb those ashes. That's why they used to say when you, you know, had codes in the military, when you got done using them, you had to burn them and store the ashes. That's why when you, you know, have emails on your computer that you want to get rid of, you don't just delete them. You have to rewrite over them like 10 times and use a program that rewrites over them. You know, information is pretty tough. And, and the information that's encoded in your brain is pretty tough. That's why DNA can be found at crime scenes 50 years later and still convict someone of a murder. 
But we feel the information that makes up the mind, right? Those tangled nerves and synapses does have a shelf life. I don't know exactly without, you know, knowing exactly how every thought is encoded in the brain. We're not that smart yet. But I do have some feelings that, you know, past a week or something like that at room temperature is, I don't, I don't see how anything could be left other than DNA. That's just my personal feeling. Backed by no science, just my common sense judgment. Question? Yes. I actually have two questions. One is, how many companies are doing this, and what's the operational difference between them? And my second question is, uh, do you, have you heard anything about downloading your brain on a chip? Yes, I I have, and again, the, the downloading your brain on a chip, that might be the way to go, it might not be. Nobody knows, uh, and that's the future. Uh, me, I'm personally, I'm attached to my body, no pun intended. I, I, I wanna come back as me. But um, that being said, um, you, you mentioned the other organizations. There's pr primarily three long-lasting organizations that have been around for a long time. There is us, there's uh, Elcor in Arizona. They charge a lot more, we charge a lot less. People say, well, how come? And I'm biased, I say, because we're better and we're more efficient. Um, but there is another organization in Russia, Cryorus. They've been doing it for a while. Uh, they seem to be doing pretty well. Uh, there is Cryonics Oregon, a uh, new startup organization. Uh, I think there's one in Miami, new startup. I don't even know if they have. They have one patient. Trans Time has one patient. So the, all the other, other than the three big ones, the other organizations are pretty small. American Chronic Society actually had their own facilities and ended up rolling all their patients in with us at CI, as did Cryospan. They rolled their patients in. So we kind of swallowed up the smaller organization so that they wouldn't have to run operations because we were, we're efficient and we, we do a good job of what we do. Hi there. Uh, so you've talked about the hospital of the future and how that's uh, undetermined and unknown at this time. My question is, is the board of directors in the future, are they tasked with figuring out how to uh, reanimate all of these people? Is it part of the contract that you sign when you go into this? Well, it, 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 it's our longstanding mission is to preserve you and to bring you back. That is written into our incorporation and our mission law. So everyone who, who is in Cryonics, in our board of directors, they're all members themselves. And they've got family members that are frozen as well. So they've got a vested interest in seeing their moms and dads and brothers and sisters and themselves brought back. So because of that, because of the way we wrote that into our bylaws, everyone has a vested interest. We're built into it generationally for the next generation and next generation and so forth. Unless you change the bylaws, and it'd be so hard to do that, you need like two-thirds of the membership to say, yeah, this is a really good idea, but we're just going to outsource this. In uh, response to what he mentioned before, if he had a heart attack today, how soon would an ambulance be here? What's the closest ambulance to support anybody who joins us? What's the turnaround? Like, if he had a heart attack now, what would we do? Are we going to ice him down? What's the closest ambulance? How do we move forward if someone was to join this? Okay, well, number one is joining it ahead of time so you can learn about the preparation process or the standby process. I've actually written a manual about standby, standby equipment. I actually have it outside. Uh, it's free to upload a PDF. Again, I'm not trying to make any money. It's just all there. Tons of information about what you can do to get resources locally on your side. There's two schools of thought. One school of thought is just hire a outside organization like Suspended Animation, uh, and they'll come. There, I call that centralized standby, and there's one in Florida, there's one in California, and they can come out to you, and they can ice you down, they can do the beginning process of chronics and prepare you, and so you get a really good suspension. Uh, that's if they can get to you in time. You know, where do you live in Florida? Where do you live in? I live in Wisconsin. So I always recommend a hybrid of the second alternative, which is local standby. That means I'm talking to my family, and I'm telling them, this is what I want you to do. 
I'm talking to my doctor, my funeral director. I've got a plan for them. I went through this book. They've seen it. Every six months we meet up. I, I go so far as to take my uh, funeral director out to lunch to make sure that I'm not wasting his time. You know, you build a relationship, right? You, and uh, get, him a, get him some donuts, you know, buy, buy him some coffee, the, guy, the whole crew. And they, instead of being that kooky Kranich's guy, I'm the guy that brings donuts now. <laughs> you know, and they remember that, and they remember that. Yeah. And, 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 and so, in fact, that worked out so good that one of the funeral directors happened to be the director of all funeral directors in Wisconsin, and he invited me to a continuing education class. So I had this whole audience of funeral directors explaining what I'm explaining to you. And I didn't have to win them over on the concept of chronics. Right? I didn't have to say, I want you all to join chronics. Instead, I was trying to win them over on honoring a person's last wishes as long as it's ethical, it's legal, and you're compensated sufficiently for it. Okay, so I'm not asking you to break the law, I'm not asking you to do something bad, and I'm not asking you to do something for free. You're in this business. Uh, be professional and honor the wishes of the chronicists. Move quickly, ice them down, and get them from point A to point B, and you're going to make everyone happy, including the family. Question from the back here. Okay, I have uh, two questions. Number one, what about the weird dynamics? Let's say there's a 30-year-old female. She has a 5-year-old son, and you freeze the 30-year-old. The son lives to be 70, and he dies, and he freezes himself. So the son's going to come back older than the mother. And if you have large-scale, multiple families doing this, isn't that going to be weird dynamics in the future? We've Where younger people will be older than, <laughs> uh, I mean... You know, how, how, how is that all going to work out? Yeah, some people might say the dynamics are getting weird already today, with, you know, with a lot of things going on. Um, okay. Robert, Robert Ettinger, right, uh, the founder of Cranix, he's married twice. Both his wives are in Cranix. So that's going to be an interesting conversation. <laughs> but I wish him well. I wish him all well. Maybe he can get cloned, and then each clone can go with each wife, maybe, and Maybe that'll work. I don't know. You know, Good and question, also to, just to address that, the, the idea is at that point in time where we can bring people out of cryonic suspension, we will we'll have age reversal where people will be healthy and be able to live unlimited lifespans as well. George. Okay, I, I have another philosophical religious question. Okay, when a person is frozen, what happens to their spirit or soul? And what about if somebody goes to heaven or hell and then they're, they're in hell and they're brought back are they pulled back from hell if you believe in heaven or hell? Oh, you know what? That's a good question, and I've heard that question. I presume the people in hell are going to be pretty happy. <laughs> no, but, uh, I, you know, I've brought people back from the dead, a lot of people in my job, in my day job. And uh, often the family doesn't say, oh, my, my little girl, where's her soul? <laughs> you know, is she a zombie? You know. They're just happy to have her back. And I've never witnessed anyone argue with me whether they, they had it really good in heaven or they didn't have it good in hell or whatever. Um, typically, some of those people are selling books about their experience. Um, not, I'm not trying to be jaded or anything like that, but that might be a motivator. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's never happened to me myself. I've never died and came back on the operating table or anything like that. And I've never had a single customer... Uh, come back to me and and address me um, in that fashion. They've all said, thanks for bringing me back. Maybe, you know, sent us some cookies at the firehouse. What do you have set up for immediate action when the person dies and they're a member and why do you talk to funeral directors? What do they have to do with it? Well, funeral directors are the necessary evil and necessary network built into the death process. Uh, no matter what, you're going to need a funeral director. It's just legally the issue. If you're, if you're going to do anything with a dead body, you need a funeral director. That's state law in every state in the union and probably most countries in the world. So you've got to use them anyhow. So if you've got these people on hand, why not use them? Use that network to help out with some of the medical, the basic medical stuff, the layperson stuff. You don't have to, you know, I like to say, what's going to save you? The best doctors in the world and the best equipment seven hours away? Or your neighbor who happens to be a plumber who saw CPR on TV 
who can he could save you, right? If you need CPR, you need CPR. The American Heart Association realized that when they pushed the idea of layperson CPR out into the community. Seattle has is the best place to die, by the way, Seattle, because everybody is trained in CPR all through their whole public school system. The second best is Milwaukee. We got a really good EMS system. So I'm bragging about myself there on that one. But number one is Seattle because everyone knows how to do CPR and there's public access defibrillators everywhere. So, uh, you know, what are we going to do? Well, if you did sign up with suspended animation as well as Cranix Institute and you did read my manuals and you did do some planning, you've got a very good chance of getting a good suspension. If you went that much further and you set up some local standby with your funeral director and your family, you've got another layer. So it's redundancy. Add more layers, more and more layers of protection. And you could go on and on and spend a fortune, uh, but a lot of it's just spending time. It's not so much spending money as it is opening the book, reading the directions, you know, and do it yourself, a little roll up your sleeves. Because Cranix really isn't totally a turnkey operation. You can't just say, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. Honey, I want to do Cranix. And then you don't do anything else. It's not how it works. You have to do something. You have to join, sign the paperwork, you know, go through your will, uh, talk to your doctor, talk to your funeral director, your, talk to your family and friends, wear, wear the bracelet that identifies your wishes or your necklace or wallet ID card. There's three ways you can die. You know, one way you can die is, is witnessed planned arrest. I'm terminal, I'm in a hospital, I've got some kind of lung cancer. That gives plenty of time for suspended animation or my family to be at the bedside and be ready to do CPR. I mean, ice could be in the other room. And then boom, I'm gonna get taken care of. One way would be unplanned witness arrest. I fall off the stage and I'm dead right here. Well, there's no ice in this room that I know of, but maybe there's some down the block and you know, hopefully Bill and Neil and the people who understand my Cranix wishes will get in the car and run and get some ice while they've called 911, while someone else is doing CPR. Hopefully I don't get frozen right away, they bring me back. But if need be, I'll get cooled down as fast as possible, and I'll be on a, uh, the, we'll con the Cranix Institute would contact a local funeral director that's helped out in the past in the Miami area or the Fort Lauderdale area, and I'd be shipped out to uh, the Detroit area. They, they would already be on standby, ready to perfuse me. 24-7, uh, they're on standby, and, and then I'd be in the container waiting for the future, but at least I'd have a chance. A couple of times tonight, Dennis has mentioned suspended animation. It's an organization that basically has a cryo ambulance, a, an ambulance for cryonic patients. There's one here in, in South Florida. There's another one out in California. And we actually had that ambulance here at the church, and a presentation was done on it. So if you'd like more information on suspended animation, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch that presentation given by Catherine Baldwin a couple of years ago. So thank you on that, Dennis. We have another question back in the back of the room. Real quick before I forget, there was a third way you could die, unwitnessed, unplanned arrest, right? I'm in the woods all alone, no family. I'm in bed all alone uh, or like on a boat. Well, we used to say you're SOL when that happens. Uh, but we're coming up with new ideas now. I've got a, a phone with a smart app that gives your GPS location, checks on you. If you don't answer it, it'll send a warning and text message to your friends. Not such a bad idea, if, even if you're not in Cranix. It's kind of like a life alert in reverse. Now, even better than that is the Apple phone that checks your pulse and sees if your rate goes low or high, and it does the same thing. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. I was going to say that. So if you have an Apple Watch that's checking your pulse and, and it will contact automatically your next of kin or people who, who, will, who will find you, that's, that's something that I think we'll see that in the next year or two, Dennis. Well, I think that's going to be right around the corner. In fact, some people, I believe, have... Uh, prototypes right now. Okay, question. Hi, quick question for you. So 28,000 basically includes unlimited number of years until the, the solution is going to be come up to. So that's, if, it's got, if, if the solution is going to be in 300 years or 800 years, it's still, the body's still going to get maintained? Yes. That's, that is the plan uh, because it's not like we're going to just start taking money away from the 28,000. Most of the money is going to sit in uh, endowment fund. It's going to be in the S&P 500, for instance. The interest on that money is going to pay for the liquid nitrogen, the taxes, and, and so forth. Now, if we only got one person in a building, uh, scales of economy are not that 
that great, or economies of scale, I should say. If we've got 100 people in the building, or 200, right, now we're dividing the cost of the building, the taxes, and liquid nitrogen we can buy in bulk, suddenly the price becomes much cheaper. So it is advantageous for more of us to sign up. That makes sense from a stand, that standpoint. But there is, in theory, no reason why you should run out of money as long as the world economy doesn't collapse. If the world economy collapses, then you've got bigger problems than cryonics. Here we go. Question. <laughs> what happens if some drug company, which charges very high prices, finds the way to reanimate and they're charging a million dollars to reanimate? Then what? So that's a good question. New technologies, when they come out, they have patents, right? And the latest television set is going to cost the most, the plasma TV. But then what happens over time? Those patents wear out. Other people make copies. It's, it's the way capitalism works. And then uh, suddenly there's hundreds of people making the television sets. Uh, that's why aspirin, for instance, is so cheap. turns out that aspirin does a lot of the things the fancier pharmaceutical uh, um, anti-inflammatories did that cost more. And it turns out aspirin did better, but nobody could patent the aspirin because it was grandfathered in. And it was cheap. And guess what hospitals use mostly for cardiac arrest? Aspirin. So it's, it's very interesting. So if, yeah, it may be that the very first people in cryonics, it costs a lot. And it might be a little clunky, too. I don't want to be the first guy revived. I'd rather have them perfected a little bit. And I'd like to see the price come down. You know, the, the, what, did you like the first, remember the first cell phones we had, how they worked compared to the cell phones we have now? You know, they're cheaper, better, faster, smarter. Maybe it's going to be that way with Chronix. And I, my, I, my guess is they're going to probably, you know, bring the animals out before the people. And even probably better than that, they'll probably simulate it in a computer and make sure they get out all the bugs before they start messing with life forms. That's just my guess. Yeah, eventually, you might have to wait for the price to, of reanimation to go down, but eventually, all the, all the 28,000s that we needed in principle, right, we need, all we needed was the interest to pay for your perpetual storage. But now, all of a sudden, we're starting to find we can actually revive people, right? Well, maybe we got to wait five years for the price to come down, but now we can dissolve the whole company, not just the interest, the principle, all the, the, everything we've got, maybe the robotic systems we have, all the cryostats, the building, the land, everything can be dissolved and go to reanimation. And there'd be really no reason to hang on to that equipment and all those assets. It, it would make sense to convert all of that to the reanimation. And if it takes five years, fine. If it takes 500 years, well, then you're in cryogenics longer. To you, you won't notice. It'd be another blink of an eye. Any other questions? Over here. Thank you. Have you considered the fact that reanimation may not be desirable by future inhabitants of the planet? Anything is possible. Um, it's like saying, you know, can I consider that at some point we won't want to live longer than 50? We might just decide collectively it's just not worth it and we're going to get rid of hospitals and medicine i mean anything's possible it's just highly unlikely for as much money is spent on trying to become younger and trying to become healthier and trying to live longer even even superficially through plastic surgery and makeup and clothing um the desire is there the desire is huge not everyone cares though not everyone is going to get the liposuction and and do all these superficial things not everyone's going to exercise right and, and eat the right foods but some people aren't going to want to be cryopreserved ever and they're going to want to die naturally but we believe the vast majority of people love life and will want to live at least as long as possible Oh, I'm sorry. I meant the populations of the future may not want to be burdened by the inhabitants from the past. Well, what I believe is the very last people going into Cranics are going to have relatives. You know, like Uncle Charlie, we just put him away two weeks ago, and now we can defrost him. Uncle Charlie 
that, you know, his nephews and nieces are going to have a strong desire to get Uncle Charlie out because he was just frozen two weeks ago. So Cryonics is going to be freezing people right up until when it's possible to unfreeze people. So at that point, there's going to be vested, a huge community vested interest in bringing your family and friends back who were just recently put into cryogenic suspension. And then those people will probably have friends older than them, right? and family older than them, and they'll want to bring them back. And also, it's a benevolent thing to do. You know, I could ask you the same question. Why do we even, why do we take people who are homeless, who have no family or friends, and, and spend tons of money on bringing them back in the hospitals? You know, maybe they had a heart attack, and why, why would we care about those people? Because as a whole, we're benevolent. We care about people. We care about life. So these people in cryogenics, they're patients, just like anyone else, okay? And we want to help them. And I don't know. That's what I believe a benevolent society will be. If, if the world isn't benevolent, if it's dystopian, then you won't be brought back and it won't matter. That's my belief. Thank you. Dennis Kowalski from the Crimex Institute. Thank you. Good job. I'd like to mention the fact that, uh, as it was brought out, there are a number of organizations that do cryonic suspension. Dennis Kowalski, the president of the Cryonics Institute in Michigan, is one of, the, one of them. We also have Devere here from Miami, from Osiris. Glad to have you, Devere. And, but, but my point is we, we, don't, well, we, we don't endorse any organization. We, we endorse the idea of cryonics and support you and we'll bring you information on these types of things but we don't endorse any specific organization uh, when it comes to uh, that. It's very important for you to do your own research and decide what organization will best suit your needs and, and what, which one you, you think is the best for you, what's the best fit. Uh, you have Dennis here tonight and a number of cryonicists that can talk with you if you have questions after the event tonight. This is a great time to get those questions answered and we have books in the library on cryonics that can help give you some information and, uh, and uh, solve some of the questions that you may have here this evening. At this point, I'd like to bring up uh, the gentleman who has worked his entire life on the cutting edge of health and longevity and the men who have founded this church. Let's give a warm welcome to our own Mr. Bill Falloon. Thank you, Neil. Good evening, group. Four years ago, there was a charitable organization that made a presentation about reversing Alzheimer's disease. Now, if you pick up any peer-reviewed publication today or a lay magazine, a newspaper, they will open up by stating Alzheimer's only goes in one direction. You become progressively more demented until you lose functionality, you turn into a vegetable, linger a few years in a nursing home, and die. Four years ago, an irrefutable evidence was presented in this church showing that early stage Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment that often precedes Alzheimer's is reversible. This was a charitable group. They had no money to make. They had no magic potion. They talked about changing the way people eat, removing toxins from their body, taking certain nutrients, medications, extensive blood testing. And guess what? That was published four years later. And I presented this slide last month. 100 people with mild cognitive impairment, early stage Alzheimer's, had it reversed using, yeah, reversed, <laughs> using the very technologies that were described in this church four years ago. Now, if someone was in this church listening and they were experiencing some mild cognitive impairment, they could have logged onto that website Sharp Again Naturally is the name of that group, Sharp Again Naturally, and they could have read the protocol. It was relatively easy to implement, but it required very strict dietary practices. And if they didn't pay attention or weren't in this church, they would have declined to the point where at this stage they may have been truly irreversible. But what the media tells you and even what the scientific community relays does not always relate to reality. And... We know this. We know this because we see it before our eyes. 
And then the December 2018 cover of Discover Magazine, they published an extensive article on the very protocol those three women from that charitable group, Sharp Again Naturally, described on this podium in November 2014. So if you keep your nose to the grindstone from the standpoint of paying attention to publish scientific information and the people who happen to know a little bit more than that, you can spare yourself some horrendous, horrendous problems. This is the opening article in that December 2018, Discover Magazine, they interviewed a number of people who had been demented and they were no longer demented. They were restored to varying degrees of functionality. In some cases, people who were in kind of a senior citizen's care facilities, they were able to regain their independence, go back to work, go back to living by themselves, going back to be able to take care of themselves from a, a personal hygiene standpoint and cook their own food. This happened. So when someone says something is irreversible or impossible, often they're simply wrong. They just don't know where to go to get the information. And I don't claim to know where all the information is. I was just introduced to this charity back in year 2013. And I said, well, this is fantastic. I reviewed all the protocols. It made scientific sense. I said, well, why don't you put on a presentation to this church? And they volunteered their time to do that, to spare humans the indignities and the eventual death caused by Alzheimer's. Terrible situation. But what we aim to do is reverse biological aging so that if a person is suffering some pathology in their brain, we can potentially reverse that and restore them back to a more youthful functionality. This is a revised stair-step approach, a sequential order of biological age reversal techniques. Now, the previous version of this listed a drug called rapamycin as the number one priority, and we still think it may be. Problem is, the dose that we've used in some clinical studies may be too low to give us the results we're seeking. Because what we're seeking to do is suppress a protein in your cells called mTOR. Stands for mechanistic target of rapamycin. Most of us, uh, not in this church, but in other places, they're overeating and they're not taking care of themselves. Elevated mTOR accelerates aging. Turned on mTOR, you slow and reverse aging. So what we're advocating people do until we identify the ideal dose of rapamycin, it's five milligrams a week. And if you're taking that now, it's okay. No toxicity, no problem. It's just not giving us the results we're looking for. We're going to advocate what I've talked about since 2013 in this church, and that is metformin, an anti-diabetic drug that has AMPK activating properties that then indirectly suppress mTOR. And add to that metformin some intermittent fasting, some calorie restriction, different types of compounds that boost AMPK, a number, a number of them are out there, suppress that mTOR, move up to restoring some of your NAD, and then your cells are ready to start to be selectively removed. I'm talking about your senescent cells that are prevalent throughout our aging body and are a major factor in degenerative aging. And the senolytic protocol that we recommend is a drug called dacetinab and a nutrient called quercetin. Just use it two times a year and you will purge your body of lots and lots of senescent cells. I've spoken about that in many, many forums. That has demonstrated a 90% efficacy rate in people with severe bone-on-bone -bone osteoarthritis, and we're getting confirmatory data. People using other senolytic compounds also seeing arthritis virtually disappear. And arthritis is the primary target. If, we were, if we're reversing arthritis and inducing cartilage regeneration, we think we're also redu uh, inducing systemic regeneration. Now, this stair step goes up to year 2030. This is where we need to live to in order to take advantage of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology. That is likely to be the ultimate cure for biological aging. Once that's perfected, and they expect to have it perfected in about 12 years, people will no longer die from aging. But there'll be other issues, so we hopefully have aging taken care of by year 2030, and then we 
want to make sure we control our risk of a lot of diseases, uh, accident prevention. We have to really take care of ourselves because what a number of experts are stating, if we make it to year 2050, we may be able to merge with the cloud. The singularity is going to give us the capability of achieving physical immortality, which is what this church was founded upon. The idea of mankind creating technologies that will facilitate the transformation of life into an era of perpetual abundance. And abundance is the topic really I'm gonna talk about during this lecture, because this is the holiday season. We have these nice bright lights, and we might assume that that's the way it used to be in the past. We all often romanticize the past as a time where people were having a lot of fun, and you know, it was cheery, and, and it was very illuminating. But that's not really the way it was. Unless you had a lot of money, you could not afford candles, you couldn't afford whale oil, you certainly couldn't afford petroleum because they hadn't figured out how to even pull that out of the ground yet. So instead of having a bright lit, lit situation, in reality, it was rather, rather dull. This is for the wealthy people. The wealthy people who could afford to burn down those very expensive candles made out of precious animal fat. And, and basically, you were starving people to make an expensive candle so you could have light. And there were such so many food shortages back there. People literally starved to death while they were using the animal fat for, for candle wax. But for most people, when that sun went down on Christmas Eve or any night, well, you just went to sleep. You just went to sleep. I mean, there was nothing. It was totally dark. No light, no energy to produce the light. You just waited till the sun rose. That's the way it was. And we take so much of that for granted. And the cost of being able to even light an oil lamp was so prohibitive that people just weren't doing it. They couldn't afford to do that. Uh, buying a gallon of fuel, if you can imagine paying a half a week's salary. And people ask about prionics and future costs. Costs are going to come down. It's going to get real cheap at some point to revive cryopreserved people. So we're not really worried about that. And this is what I'm going to try to analogize here with this presentation. For thousands of years, no one believed that you could drill a hole in the ground and pump out petroleum. People wanted it. They wanted to use it for, for lighting, for various energy and heating purposes. It was just too expensive. It was considered impossible by all the experts, except an individual named Edwin Drake. He thought that if you properly drilled a hole in the ground, that you could potentially extract petroleum and pump it out and ship it to other places. Almost everyone thought it was nuts. A few people put some money in, but they even gave up. But Edwin Drake, he persisted. He persisted when investors withdrew, when people ridiculed him, when he failed, by the way, many, many times. Almost every attempt he made to erect an oil drilling rig and, and pump that oil out. It failed for technical reasons that you might think don't make a lot of sense, but read it up on, on the internet. Just check on the internet about the history of oil drilling and you'll see how challenging it was. Drake, by himself, may have been the only person in the world who thought this was possible. Well, he persisted, and guess what? 1859, he strikes oil. He shows that you can pull oil out of the ground and I know that sounds simplistic right now. You think, yeah, anyone could have done that. Not the case. Very, very challenging. And that petroleum led to the Industrial Revolution, which has led to many other revolutions that we're enjoying today. But you look how fast technology advances once something is proven to work. So 1859, August, the first oil well produces oil. And by 1860, they're loading it onto ships in western Pennsylvania and moving it to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to use in different industries. Oil was a big factor in Pittsburgh's industrial growth. And in 1961, an oil well was producing 300 barrels a day. That was a world record. Five months later, in 1861, it's 4,000 barrels a day. And analogize that to what we're trying to do as far as longevity. We're seeking to live to be 130. 180, 300, forever. Once the technologies start to evolve and we understand more and more about the biosciences, longevity enhancement, it's just going to happen. There will be money to be made. There will be curiosity. There will be people like me who just want to do it, and we're going to make that happen. In 1861, the United States was the first country to export oil to London. 
Think about that. This country was the one that did it, and oil is a big reason why this country continues to enjoy economic dominance. So we should pay a tribute, and I know environmentally this may not impress you very much, but these forms of energy are going to be dissipated over the next 30, 40 years. There'll be other ones. A little bit of a tribute to a guy named Edwin Drake who persisted when everyone said it can't be done, investors pull their money out, and he just keeps at it. He doesn't give up. And this is the secret of success, by the way, of every pioneer. They're humiliated, they endure persecution, sometimes they're executed, uh, but they don't give up. And when people talked about cost and concerns about cryonics, look what happened when oil drilling technology advanced just a few years after. It was $10 a barrel in the beginning. $10 a barrel, within one year, it goes down to 10 cents. So if you think $28,000 is insufficient to revive you, it may be, but guess what? There are multi-billionaires who have set up revival trust. Dennis didn't mention this, but very wealthy people are taking their money with them. And they specify in those trusts to fund research, fund reanimation, do all kind of good things. So money's going to be there even if the people with only $28,000 are, are going to have to wait a little bit longer. So but this is an example of something that was very expensive becoming cheap real fast just because technology advanced. And offshore drilling started in California. It was a big part of California's success. They start from the beaches, drill it out into the ocean, but they were afraid to go out beyond the site of land because it was very dangerous. And Baron, again, this is 1901. In 1859, Edwin Drake, for the first time, shows you can, from the ground, drill down and pull up oil, they're going out into the ocean. And by 18 or 1947, uh, less than 100 years later, they've got these huge oil derricks, thousands of them around the world, going tens of thousands of feet down into the ocean, pulling up oil. And, and again, this may just sound like that's an easy thing to do. It isn't. It takes a lot of technology. But that kind of technology, if that evolves with biomedical sciences, guess what? We're going to live forever. We are never going to die if biomedical science advances at this rate. And you look at some of the hiccups that come along the way. Hey, we've all been around, almost all of us, 1973, sitting in line, waiting two hours to fill up your tank with gas. And in the 1970s, every single expert stated there is only a limited supply of oil left. By around the year 2000, it'll all be gone. The world's going to turn dark again. We're going to return to the Middle Ages, and there'll be no hope for civilization. This was universal. There was not one person who said, we're not going to run out of oil, because there's only supposedly a limited supply, right? If there's only so much of something and you're pumping it out real fast, it's eventually going to run empty. Well, that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case. An individual named George Mitchell. This is another hero from the standpoint of looking at a problem and saying, I think I can figure a way around that. He started in 1994 with some advanced concepts that, again, environmentally, I know people don't like it, but fracking and, and horizontal drilling, all kinds of advanced techniques that he was involved in in the early years, and it worked. Despite everyone saying you couldn't access those types of oil deposits, he figured out a way to do it, to do it became a multi-billionaire. Fortunately, he died year 2013, was not cryopreserved, preserved and as far as I know, just didn't follow some of the aggressive lifestyles that we do at this church. So, December 6th, a couple days ago, Wall Street Journal, United States of America, becomes a net exporter. We're just like OPEC right now. We're exporting oil and making money at it. Now remember, we were supposed to run out of it by year 2000. And even in 2005, the prospect was we, 30 or 40 years, we'd be out of oil. Instead, technology improved. And what was unthinkable just 10 years ago is occurring every single day in this country. We're exporting oil. We'll never run out of it. So the impossible happened during our lifetime in an area that was challenging. And I'm telling you, you're going to see some incredible advances in the biomedical arena and I'm intimately involved with a number of these, we're seeing these incremental improvements. And at some point, once we reach a level where we're inducing meaningful age reversal, we're going to see people living a long time in a great state of health. 
And this shows you, starting in 1920, the oil uh, production and how in 1970s it peaked in this country. People thought it was just going to go down to nothing, to zero. And in reality, we're pumping more now than we were in 1970. We've, we, we've literally reached a, a point of reversing this terrible decline. So for anyone who thinks life in the olden days was somewhat better than it is now, this is the book that I always recommend you buy. Just go to Amazon, get it for a couple dollars used. The good old days, they were terrible because in contrast to today, they were. Just from a medical standpoint, think about esophageal reflux, you know, just chronic heartburn pain. A lot of our founding fathers suffered from that, by the way, and there was no antidote for it, really. You just suffered you suffered uh, an impacted wisdom tooth. You just suffered. I, I mean, it was horrific. Think of the chronic problems that pre pretty much I think we've all suffered from in this room, certainly myself. And there was a medication there for me to get rid of that chronic problem. They didn't have it back then. They also didn't have good lighting. They, they didn't have much of anything. And yet uh, people somehow think it was better back then. The pollution, back, by the way, back then was beyond description beyond it. The streets filled with horse manure, uh, open chimneys, burning coal, wood to keep the house warm. It was a miserable existence, and yet we persisted. So we take for granted what we're enjoying right now. We think it was always available, easy to obtain. No, it took a lot of pioneers to give us what we have right now. But because of those pioneers, we now have the ability to carry that ball forward in the biomedical field, which is what our priority is. So we don't have to live in darkness anymore. We have technology to reverse Alzheimer's disease and yet virtually nobody knows about it. So when you wonder what this church was formed for, it was to take advantage of everything I talked about for the last 15 minutes and transform our existence into eternal abundance. Unlimited supplies of resources, unlimited wealth, huge improvements in human longevity to the point where Mortality will be an option. If you want to live 300 years, that's up to you. If you want to live for an indefinite period of time, again, that option will be available. If anyone has any direct questions for me, I'll answer them. Questions for Bill. First of all, a hand for a great inspirational presentation. Thank you, Bill. There's a question from John over here. Yeah, Bill, I take uh, metformin to the tune of about 1,000, 1,500 milligrams a day, and I know that we're supposed to supplement, or would be best idea to supplement B12, somewhere in that process, and I take the life extension to a day as, you know, one of my many, many, many supplements that I use. Is that enough B12? Well, metformin interferes with the absorption of vitamin B12. The consensus in the medical community is if you just take a multivitamin supplement, you're probably okay, but the surrogate marker would be homocysteine. If your homocysteine levels are elevated and they go up even higher with metformin, it probably means you need more vitamin B12. And some people who take metformin, they need vitamin B12 shots. And for me, that's a small price to pay. I, I take a vitamin B12 shot now just once a week. I've got my homocysteine under control. I take lots and lots of metformin. So yeah, um, metformin can impede uh, the absorption of vitamin B12. You can take a lot more orally. You can get vitamin B12 shots. It's a small price to pay for the benefits that metformin confers. I have a question from the internet, from online, Bill, if I could. Uh, they're asking, they said that uh, last month you had mentioned that you had 10 odd colonoscopies and would like to have a rundown on a testing regime and frequency, maybe a, a basic what to do testing wise. Yeah, I do a lot of medical diagnostics. I have my blood tested every three to four weeks, sometimes more frequently. I've had whole body MRIs. For people who can afford it, and I hate to talk about stuff that most people find challenging from an affordability standpoint, but um, every 14 months or so, at our age, having a whole body MRI could pick up a lot of interesting data, including a very small malignancy that could be very easily removed before it grows into clinically relevant disease. Um, I mean, I do endoscopies to look at the stomach and the esophagus. Esophageal cancer is killing about 19,000 people every year in this country. Colon cancer down to about 50,000. So they recommend colonoscopies for everybody and they forget about endoscopies. You can do them both, by the way, at the same time uh, while you're sedated. Um, and these are good diagnostics to do. If you get good insurance, they'll cover it. If not, you're going to have to pay for it out of pocket. Thank you, Bill. Question? Uh, 
Yes, Bill. Um, by tomorrow, I'll have completed the first three steps. Now we talk about the fourth step, which is this young plasma or stem cells. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, what we're looking into are either exosomes from stem cells. Those are factors released by rapidly dividing stem cells in laboratory vats, and they make it quite affordable to derive the youth-promoting benefits of stem cells without putting stem cells in your body, which we still don't know how safe and effective that can be when injected systemically. Um, so you've got a number of options that we are exploring right now. We don't have a definitive protocol as to which direction to go. Some people are having young plasma put in their body every four to eight weeks. Uh, some people are using different types of plasma concentrates. Uh, there's a wide variety of options, so we just use the young plasma as the general description for what are now six to seven different options. Uh, we're going to have a definitive recommendation very soon, but uh, right now uh, that, that next step is kind of your choice, and I suggest you wait. Yes, Bill. Um, I'm a big fan of rapamycin, and um, isn't the dosaging uh, in terms of time release a better approach to use rapamycin as an anti-aging drug than uh, just using it uh, in a... Metformin time release, is, time release is better, but not rapamycin. Uh, what you want rapamycin to do is get into your body real fast, hang around for about 30 hours, and then disappear. Because rapamycin, if taken every single day, induces side effects. The benefit... Yeah. Uh, for example, how do you see the link uh, to counteract uh, rheumatoid arthritis, for example, with rapamycin? As we a one-time treatment, would you not think that's not effective enough? One time a week. The dose of rapamycin, one time a week, derive the benefits for the 30 hours, suppress that mTOR, induce autophagy, which is removing cellular debris that accumulates in our older cells, um, get all those benefits, and then let it disappear. You don't want the rapamycin to hang around. So once a week dosing, five milligrams has now been used by lots and lots of people. Uh, if they combine it with metformin and aspirin and a number of other drugs, uh, some re good reports are coming in. But a study that we're helping to fund indicates that the five milligram dose may not be potent enough. So we need to do a study perhaps of 15 or 20 milligrams. And rather than telling you to do that, let us do the study first to evaluate safety and efficacy. Hi, Bill. For us lay people who are interested in life extension, what would you say are the five uh, most important, lowest hanging fruit, most affordable things that you can do to extend your life right now? Number one is reduce your calorie intake, engage in intermittent fasting, figure out some way to relieve the chronic burden that our current dietary habits are inflicting on us. We, we, we are literally eating ourselves to a premature death. So look at what you're doing from a dietary standpoint. I think most of us know what foods are healthy, what foods are not. But even if we eat too many healthy foods, we're overburdening ourselves. We're putting ourselves into a position of risking cancer, dementia, vascular disorders. So food eliminate as much as you're able to. I've slowly done it over a 21 year period of time. I've never gone hungry. I've never denied myself food once, and yet I'm down to about the weight I was when I was 21 years of age. At one point, I was about 40 pounds heavier. I was not healthy at 40 pounds heavier, and I was able to do that. And there's some other people in this room, by the way, who have lost significant weight recently. I wanna congratulate them, by the way. They've decided they're not gonna let food shorten their lifespan. And then as it relates to those other four, depends on your individual variability. Of course, we want you to get physical activity in, but blood testing is so important. You need a comprehensive blood test to identify what's most important for you to do. Some people have very high LDL and they can't get it down. They need an expensive medication, but most people don't need that. So the blood test kind of tells us, do you need your glucose lower? Do you need your homocysteine brought under control? So that blood test then dictates what as an individual is most important to you. And by the way, the Alzheimer's reversal, that occurs in response to a very elaborate blood test, genomic test, so that they can identify what's causing your Alzheimer's. 
there's at least three different types of Alzheimer's out there and maybe six. So you need to attack the pathology that's creating your own dementia. Hi, Bill. Uh, on the rapamycin, did you do a, a cycling uh, protocol or was it just continuous on the five milligrams that you talked about? It's continuous, five milligrams once a week. There's people who have been doing it now for a number of years. And again, no serious side effects, that's good. Uh, but we're not seeing the benefits that we wanted to see at this stage. And, and I'm giving you real-time information. This has not even yet been published. It will eventually that the five milligrams safe, but not generating the results that we're looking for. You contrast that to NAD infusions, where we saw systemic age reversal occurring. Senolytics, where we saw 90% of the arthritic patients getting better. Uh, rapamycin, we're looking for some results. Now, a caveat there, most of the study subjects came in obese. They were hoping rapamycin was going to let them keep eating and lose weight. And, well, it doesn't do that. And, frankly, very few drugs are going to enable you to lose significant weight if you continue to overconsume calories. The other question was uh, the metformin and the rapamycin, are they two separate uh, entities? In other words, well, they, they, they reinforce each other. Um, the metformin boosts AMPK. That's very beneficial. And that's what metformin does. That's why we're such strong proponents of the metformin drug. And when you do intermittent fasting, by the way, you boost your AMPK. If you do aggressive physical exercise, you can boost AMPK. So that's good. And an indirect benefit of AMPK elevation is suppressing mTOR. So if you're taking 5 milligrams of rapamycin plus metformin, you're getting more mTOR suppression, you're getting the AMPK activation, and it's hard to go too far on it. Uh, if you were severely under eating and doing that, perhaps you would go too far. But I hate to say it, I mean, getting our AMPK back to where we were when we were 21 is challenging at this stage. We can just get it as high as we can for the most part. Hi, Bill. Um, I have a good friend of mine who's 91. He runs marathons and finishes them. He was a doctor, retired 50 years ago. And he said, you don't need any medication as long as you do the diet according to your blood type. Eat according to your blood type. What do you think about that? I've had people ask me that question probably 100 times over the, 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 the last uh, 10, 20 years, and I don't know the answer. So. Yeah, real, real quick, Bill. Um, what's the minimum number of hours that you would need to fast to get daily to get the benefit of intermittent fasting? The minimum number of hours is considered 12. Going 15 to 18 is better. And the way I typically do it, and, and days do vary, I go to bed, let's say, at 2 in the morning. And then I wake up maybe at 12. It, it varies. My, my schedule is very crazy. But I, I do tend to sleep more than I'd like to. It's just what my body needs. So I've got 8 to 10 hours right there from my sleep. Now, you can drink black coffee or, or just plain tea. You're allowed to do that. And, and that helps, but I don't even do that every day. So if I wake up... 12, let's say, I've, I've already got a, a good number of hours in, and then I'm, I'll go until maybe 9 o'clock at night before eating, and I'm not hungry. I mean, it, it's taken a while to get to that process, but I'm not hungry at all, so I can easily do 15 to 18 hours on certain days, uh, but everyone has a different schedule. Some people may find that they want to eat their breakfast and eat their lunch, and then dinner's just not that important to them, and they can get at least a 12-hour cycle in with no food in their body whatsoever. Ideally, though, more than 12, 15, or even 18 is going to do you better. Hmm. I've been on uh, water fasting for two and a half weeks. Not today, uh, but sunshine, fresh air, pure water, and total rest. What is the effect of that type of water fasting? Fantastic health. I mean, you basically are reversing aging processes in so many different ways. You're reversing atherosclerosis. You're putting your cells back into a more youthful state because they're going to be able to clear out that accumulated cellular junk through the process of autophagy. And we have someone here who lost a tremendous amount of weight on a water fast, and another person who lost a tremendous amount of weight doing something similar. So we, we've got real-world proof that if you engage in fasting, you're going to live longer, you're going to shed a lot of pounds, and you're going to reduce a lot of disease risk. So congratulations. Any questions? Any other questions? Over here, Richard. 
I had uh, read an article where uh, the beta amyloid plaques, they could get rid of that, but people still had Alzheimer's, uh, and the rapamycin got rid of the uh, tau tangles. Oh, yeah, the data on rapamycin is so consistent. Every single species it's tested on, they live longer. It's a potential way to reverse degenerative illness. We're just trying to ascertain the ideal dose for adults to take. And even five milligrams initially was considered perhaps high, but it looks like maybe it needs to be higher. And we don't know what that ideal dose is yet. So uh, we're gonna hopefully get a study going real soon, get people on high doses and see what kind of effects it produces. Nothing wrong with taking it, by the way, but we're not gonna put that as the first step on that approach to longevity when we realize now the dose is not as aggressive as it should be. Those who combine the rapamycin and metformin and maybe some calorie restriction, they may very well be getting those benefits. Our clinical study is only using rapamycin by itself. Hi, you had mentioned, um, I think you said desitin for bone on bone. Yeah, I mentioned dacitinab, that's a chemotherapy drug, and quercetin, which you can buy anywhere. Um, the dacitinab, when used for anti-aging purposes, is basically, let's say, four to 500 milligrams a year. A leukemia patient takes 36,000 milligrams a year. So people who are concerned about dacitinab side effects should understand it's a, it's a dose response type toxicity. If you're taking just this minute amount only two times a year, basically, it's a, a dose you take on week one and you repeat the dose on week two and you can wait a year. Um, toxicity is not a concern, but yes, dacitinab is a prescription drug and we're trying to find lower cost sources for it. Some people buy it offshore right now but for a lot less money than it costs in this country. It's outrageous in this country. Hi, um, I got stage four colon cancer. I got diagnosed with it and I take a lot of different supplements. And I was wondering about the fasting. What do I do about my supplements? Do I take them while I'm fasting or you know, not take them at all? You, at, at, at your stage, you might wanna try um, not taking the supplements if you're going to go through an 18 or 21 hour fast. You know what, there's an expert here who uh, maybe will talk to you and they're, they're doing this clinically with people and I'd almost want to refer you to that individual because they, they can give you more information than myself. I would be speculating to answer that. So after the event this evening, you can speak with Bill directly and perhaps uh, get the introduction. Do you have a, an exercise regime? Right now, I walk up and down the nine stories of my building a couple times a day. And then one hour a week, I have a trainer come in. It's insufficient for what I should be doing, but it's all the time I have. I'm in much better shape now, though. I can walk those nine flights of stairs as if it's nothing. Back in 2005, when I weighed a little bit more, there were hurricanes, the elevator was out. I lived on the sixth floor, and I could barely make it up to the sixth floor. So I'm doing better but I'm not doing anywhere near the amount of physical activity I should. Uh, Bill, uh, what do you think so far about NR, nicotinamide riboside versus MN, uh, NMN? Based on everything we have studied, because we've compared them side by side, the nicotinamide riboside works better. And you'd think the nicotinamide mononucleotide that you're talking about uh, would work better because it's one metabolic step closer but we found that NAD levels were boosting, were getting boosted better with the nicotinamide riboside. Okay, great job. Okay, there's gonna be a, a very small get together uh, with some cryonics members uh, that I'm gonna participate in. Uh, so if you don't see me for a while, uh, it's just because I'll be with four to five people. We're just gonna talk about emergency response and how we can improve that here in South Florida the Crowns community. Uh, so if, uh, if, you do, if you miss me downstairs, I'll, I'll, I'll get down there when I can. Just had a real quick question for you. How many people are here for the very first time? First time you're here at Perpetual Life? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Very good. I look forward to meeting with you. And you know, we're going to do the, uh, the uh, slide presentation here on the ceremony the remembrance of the resurrectables and i'd like to invite you to watch a little bit of that before going downstairs of course downstairs we will have a, a nice dinner 
Uh, choices are going to be fish, vegan, and turkey tonight. Thanks for coming, and we're going to see you again next month for two events. Next month, January 10th and January 24th. And I'll keep in touch. If you haven't given us your email, be sure to give it to the folks downstairs. Okay. You know, I, we are, we're, we're fortunate to have with us this evening a man who walked all the way from South Florida to New York City. Walked for nine months. And uh, so we have Eddie here. He wrote a book. And uh, Eddie, come on up. The name of the book is 10, 10 Million Smiles. 10 Million Smiles from Florida to New York. From Florida to New York. 10 Million Smiles from Florida to New York. So we have Eddie here who did all that. And I'd like to have him come up and come on over here. And he's, gonna, he's got a uh, little saying for you. Uh, this is a little something I wrote a few months ago that I'm going around and I'm, I'm reading to different people. It's, it's kind of weird because I walk up to people, they don't know who I am, and I just say, hey, can I read something to you? A lot of them say yes, some of them say no, and whatever it is, you know. So I asked Neil, and Neil honored, we, honored me with saying, yes, you can read it. So here it is. You are beautiful, and you make a difference in this world. No matter who you are, no matter what you do, there are people in this world who look up to you, people who love you and care about your well-being. A piece of their heart shines in your heart. A piece of their soul shines in your soul. A part of their energy radiates in your world, and you may not even be aware of it. Live each moment as if it's a building block to the incredible life that you deserve. Find the good in life and use it as your guide to a better future. Accept the bad as a teacher to bring you through tough times, and use your smile to engage and transform your heart into a superconductor of happiness and joy. May you live, love, and create the life of your dreams. Eddie, 10 million smiles from Florida to New York. Thank you for sharing that.